Monica and Jose. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you. And Forrest and everybody else. It's uh, like Jerry said, it's kind of awkward to be back here. But, um, and um, 12 years ago, it was quite a different place <laughs> as well. <laughs> well, things yeah. only existed in. Um, so really just a very short intro with you, where I am. Uh, this was the um, bashed Reading typography sign. I don't think it exists anymore. We <laughs> 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 yeah, actually fixed it. No, no, it's a completely new thing. <laughs> <story. laughs> but so, you know, this is Reading taught us um, this particular approach to type design. It's kind of more oriented towards industrial production and utilitarianism. Um, focused really on a, some kind of definition of processes and methods. And, you know, there we were super serious, had no gray hair, and were all black. <laughs> um, here, the younger hair and younger everybody else. <laughs> um, and, well. Well, a couple of years after that. Um, uh, we started with this idea of getting together and... and, and it was really kind of an experiment. It was, it was very experimental at first. Uh, and at the beginning we started working with a typeface just to see whether we can work together or not. And there was a, a slight problem because <laughs> Faith was here <laughs> and I was here. And um, at that time, we're talking about 2006, so uh, very beginning of 2006, end of 2005. Mm -hmm. Really, the notion of long distance, distance uh, collaboration in type design wasn't really the, as spread as it is now. Yeah. And in fact, I think collaborative design wasn't, wasn't, wasn't really that, uh, that. And we didn't see each other for over two years. So it was really just um, email, Skype, and so on. And, but we had both this idea or some kind of personal interest into editorial design, book design, you know, that kind of more serious typography. So what we're trying to do is to put together a method. For instance, this is a, 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 an A I, I drew in, in Amsterdam um, in 2004. And I sent it to Vic. I said, I've got this idea for a typeface. So Vic wrapped it and said, well, it is quite well. But uh, what if we do something like this with the ball and we fix um, the terminal, the top terminal? So she sent it back to me. And then I say, okay, I love it and it's much better, but I think it's lost a bit of the essence that it has in the first one. So we changed this terminal. And that became, became a typeface. And that, that was the way that we started working, basically jumping fast. Uh, um, so it's, yeah, it's One way like really, other. really handy to have this other pair of eyes who can bounce off each other. So um, yeah, this, this is what became Carmina. And so this kind of idea of having some sort of indie foundry at that point, indie foundries was this big new thing, sort of. Um, there were a few around and we thought, okay. Um, but with one typeface, you can't really open a shop. Uh, so we recognized the necessity of, of expanding the library and Jose, this is his work that he did uh, here in Reading. Um, we kind of finished it off. And then later on, um, Greg and Cyrillic came to that, but that's, that we, we'll touch on that later. And I had, uh, that was my, my project um, here. Um, I had it already with a front shop at that point, point, so I could not really sell it um, myself. Ten years? Fourteen years? No. Ten years? And we started to work kind of on new ideas, and um, of course, you know, in digital age, you need some kind of representation online, so we had this hideous uh, website. It was my design. <laughs> <laughs> kind of looking, looking back, but okay, you, you have to imagine this is 10 years ago, so just give us a light break. Uh, and of course, promotional material, so kind of, we really started as it goes, kind of. 
Um, and uh, we continued working on some of our own stuff, <clears throat> but also realizing that, well, we have only two hands and two brains and a certain amount of time. Uh, so to, to open up the library, <clears throat> to expand the library, we need other people. So we kind of asked uh, our colleagues at that point, we liked their work, we thought it would fit into the library. So right. this is where this kind of the forming of uh, the understanding of forming a library really started to take a bit more shape. But to, to talk about these, we really need to, to talk a little bit about the Thai business. And actually, one of the problems is, well, it's, as you can imagine, it's not just about drawing nice shapes, right? Um, there is a lot to be done to be done in terms of self the Thai. And actually, the commercialization of Thai pieces has become really, really much more complex in recent years. Uh, there are different kinds of licenses, uh, a very large amount of forms on offer, um, and the pricing structure of the forms being offered out there, uh, they vary a lot. So it, it, yes. it is a, a, a very kind of uh, complex scenario. So here, just, um, um, just to show like, kind of quickly different um, distribution models. Yeah, you, you skipped the first one, it doesn't matter. Did I know? Yeah, you did. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Well, because you know, we're kind of very, we need to be very yeah, fast well, here. Basically, you, you have the foundry selling itself to, to the people, foundry using uh, a distributor or intermediary to sell, the cloud models and the uh, rental models. Which is uh, more, more of a recent, recent development. So you, of course, have to think about pricing, right? Pricing, it's important um, to price according to your own work, but also to market standards, in a way. And being too high um, means usually harder time selling your work, but being too low, as well, is, is, is not a good idea. It's depreciating the market, and it's marking your work as of lower quality. So really, pricing should should kind of allow some sustainability uh, in terms of paying bills, staying competitive uh, at the same time. So um, basically the market price will tell you, okay, up to what level it is reasonable to sell, uh, to price a font. About this, it is harder and harder to sell it, right? But then you cannot see it, say it is zero because you have to pay for developing the font. Okay. Also, a kind of uh, insertion period into the market. You can't really expect um, typeface, so you finish it, boom, you're super happy, it's done. Okay, now... Buy it. Buy it. Come on. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't come I want you to, to buy it now. But it does not really work that way. It takes some time. If you're lucky. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you need to, to, to think ahead and to think that the, the library and the foundry should grow a little bit. Not a lot, but just a little bit. And you also need a bit of extra because you know from time to time a font fails commercially. Right? Just you don't know exactly why. It's just so in this sense uh, the, the the issue of how to to manage a budget and this is something that we weren't trained on. So basically we had to learn how to do it. And, and you can say, okay, well, there is some, there are some obvious things that you can take into account. Okay, you have to rent an office, and you have to pay vendors, you have to do some administration. But also, there are other kinds of expenses that you probably are not so obvious, right? And might not be there all the time. Um, things like, for instance, <laughs> this, this bit can eat a lot of your earnings. I'm sorry to say, and, and that little bit up there, the legal thing, <laughs> believe me, um, this is an advice for the young one, um, you want to have a lawyer because every three or four years, there will be some idiot that will, uh, I don't know, say something like, oh, that phone is 
Well, very similar to one of mine or something like that. <laughs> this is hypothetical, okay? <laughs> so you want to take, um, yeah, some kind of um, hair. <laughs> So we are talking about um, licenses. Now, like we said, <clears throat> now really it became quite complex, a bit more complex, so it seems anyway, um, the different kinds of licenses. And you, you have to sort of realize that depending a bit on your kind of offer, what you're offering, uh, how to structure this. Um, yeah, but also, uh, I think this is important to understand that um, um, People, uh, consumers, uh, clients, um, yeah, and we're already late, but we're almost finishing. They have a very hard time understanding um, how this works. I mean, the amount of different kinds of licenses that we have right now uh, implies that, um, that things um, are really, really hard to understand. What, are, what is all this thing? Why do I need this and not this? I mean, and, and trying to understand that from a from the consumer point of view um, is very hard and, and yeah, for the user, it's, for the user, it's just not very obvious. Right. So one of the things that um, that we do, uh, I think we can skip it. Yeah. Okay. Is um, is and we advise is educating users so they don't get lost. Um. I think this is how um, nowadays, at least, the feeling we get from our customer um, talking to us. Um, a lot of users really feel that way. You know, like, what the fuck? You know, what do I do exactly? French. <laughs> Sorry. Um. Um, one of the things that uh, that we did, and we kind of recommend finding a clever way of doing this, is. To, to clarify what is your business structure. How do you sell the font? How do you uh, structure your licensing offer? But of course, making sure that they understand that this is not the license agreement. The license agreement is the new that goes with the font. But there are ways to explain that. So in terms of educating you, you know, the, the user, you know, there are often problems separating the good from the bad. So this is one, one issue that we find ourselves in. Um, but you, you have other aids have available, so you can <clears throat> print stuff, digital specimens, FAQs, open type guides, all of that. Um, what has been very successful for us at least are the so-called typing use showings we started from the beginning, where you give the, um, the customer <coughs> wants to buy a typeface uh, the possibility to see, okay, here, look, this is how the type looks, how it was used before. Or even what we encounter a lot is also pairing, so how people are asking, okay, which font goes with this? Yeah, so we kind of start suggesting these type of match solutions. But also, you know, this is not just on a business level, but um, more kind of teaching the value of types, so workshops, talks with clients, with students, and so on. So um, we're already very late. Um, no, no, it's okay. No, it's okay. <laughs> um, so I think this context, uh, this complexity to the market, the independent foundries, they have a possibility. Um, by uh, having a more direct contact with the, with the clients and by structuring the type library um, properly. So uh, we're going to, to mention a few things here. Um, from, from, our from, right, from our point of view, but these things can be applied or extrapolated um, to use uh, type in the, into, into other, other models. Um, one of the things that uh, we want the, the library to do is to collaborate with uh, commercial efforts. Uh, for instance, uh, in our case, we work for the editorial uh, industry. And the editorial design uh, field has a rather constant, constant need of visual update. So this is the same newspaper throughout time. And that means that uh, we can sell forms to the same company over and over. And uh, well, those kind of more complex environments, um, they probably demand a bigger range of, uh, of styles, 
more challenging kind of typographic programs. Um, the market in general seems to require larger families, and so something that we kind of improved our procedures quite a lot over the last 10 years. And also the, the constant uh, update of technology, the change of media that uh, requires uh, fonts, by either new fonts for new technologies or updated fonts for those new technologies. And uh, finally, but not the least, uh, one of the things that, at least in our case, uh, was, uh, was very good is that the editorial um, uh, field requires text fonts, uh, or fonts that, that are, are engineered for um, continuous reading. And that is, um, sets the, the competition bar a lot higher. And that is good as well. And um, so, type library should be also part kind of, of the um, company's general character. <clears throat> so, here, this is the industrial approach we were kind of mentioning before. I hope you enjoyed the animation that was uh... <laughs> <laughs> coming, coming in other readings. And um, it uh, also kind of results in longer projects. We, um, you know, this whole expanding markets, global markets, um, it's, it's really challenging and it's really super interesting. But it allows us for longer periods, um, a bit more relaxed uh, and a more, a more planning overall. And also, it, it is projects that often re require uh, international collaboration. Uh, this is a picture of our last meeting. <laughs> okay. Sorry for our faces, but uh, we are all very concentrated, as you can see. But, um, and um, also, it fits in, into the cosmopolitan kind of uh, atmosphere from the Reading University. <laughs> so, the library, but also kind of should really improve the brand and um, product positioning. <clears throat> and here, it's quite important to research. Uh, to know the key players in your field. Uh, in our case, it would be publishers or key players in that area. Um. And what, once you understand who is doing good stuff with, within your field, it is easier to target them uh, more directly. This is a, um, a set of books from FCE, that's from the Cultura Economica, which is probably the, the most important book publisher in Mexico. Um, and once they started using our typefaces, then we were, we were able to show that, okay? And it is amazing how once uh, one of these very big, or very important, or very well-known publishers, uh, very well-known designers, they use your fonts, they tend to spread the word about it much faster. So all of these kind of things eventually help, you know, with your exposure and media coverage. And that overall part. Um, but yeah, of course, it's also kind of trying to balance commercial and but your personal interests. And um, our library kind of allows us to work on a, on a wide range of typographic styles. Uh, we try not to repeat ourselves too much and keeps us kind of um, forced to, um, to learn to keep up to date with many technology changes. And, but also it requires us to go back and do some research, do some historical findings. Again, things that, um, at least for me, picking up a lot in, in Reading. <laughs> um, so one of the important things to elaborate, uh, to, it should be coherent. Um, um, there are many advantages to this. Um, first, it is necessary to have a clear definition of what the product is. Uh, I mean, um, before understanding what is the focus of, of your um, your market. So we really kind of sell more type families so, or type palettes rather than single fonts. Other foundries like so people here is more focused on selling single fonts because it's a different um, type well, of usage. It is targets it's packaging, really. Yeah, targets packaging. So that all impacts on your licensing models, yeah, and um, 
But this focus might not be commercial at all. And Pampa Tides, Alejandro's, um, it's his interest in books. Right. So kind of focuses on that. Yeah, what are the advantages of having a you know, focus is that the time actually works in your favor. Um, as uh, the longer you have been on the market, the, the, the more you can dig into your focus, the more you can cover the whole area of your focus. Yeah, it also kind of allow, allows for a longer term planning. So what you learn today, you can reduce. Yeah, you don't have to throw your knowledge out. And it kind of, um, you can set up your, your standards, your own standards, even on a small foundry. <laughs> And uh, yeah, well, I mean, it, it also benefits business growth in terms that uh, if you have consistent uh, high quality, you have more customer loyalty. If you have uh, good coverage of the of the, the focus of the, of the library, let's you know, say the, the, the niche market that you're looking, then you also have uh, um, customers returning to find more of the more of the stuff. That they so all of yeah. that kind of builds a long-term relationship with your customer base. That's what you want. But you know you don't. You, I mean, how do you keep it interesting? You don't want to become too boring, and and how do you avoid repetition, really? So a little disclaimer: this is a very schematic overview what we're going to show. Uh, in reality, these these individual points they kind of overlap. Yeah, basically these boxes they don't look like boxes. They are like areas that merge together, but. In this way, it can be understood um, as, a, as a conceptual idea. Um, if the focus of, of the library is too wide, say you, you're covering all of these, then you can only put so many fonts into one of each box of these boxes because you don't have time to develop them, right? If, if instead of that you choose to dig into a more vertical kind of thing, um, then you can say, okay, well, my focus is really book, typography, like the design we were seeing from uh, Papa Tai. Now, but when will they start to compete with each other? Right. Yeah, so you actually have to be kind of aware of that. We need to. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. Um, now, if you pick and choose different parts, I say, okay, I think this would be commercially more, more appropriate, this would be commercially better, this would be so better. Chances are that you end up with a library that doesn't have a clear focus, which is really not the base case. And yes, if in this case you, you choose bits and pieces that relate to each other, then you might say, okay, well, all of these is fine, but what we're really selling is not editorial design, it is forms or screens. So trying to understand how this works is really helpful in the end. And finally, um, if you work with large families or with families that uh, have um, uh, what we call this, they are multiple purpose uh, families, you can cover with one family a cross section, a cross section of this spectrum. Okay? So, about the internal competition, I mean, the, um, a good idea is to complement. Basically, what, what, what we mean is when, when the, the, the phones start competing between them instead of competing, competing with, the, with the phones outside your library. And this is important because you don't want to, to have a lot of phones competing between them, but more than that, kind of complementing each other and working with each other. And then, of course, there's the whole question of trends, yeah? um, how to follow market shifts rather than trends. I mean, some, uh, it is important you know, to, to understand um, how uh, important it is for, for your library to follow these trends. Yeah? And some <coughs> libraries, um, they, they are bound to, to kind of these kind of changes than, than others. Here, just some two really extreme cases. And this is of today, all the kind of vintage stuff. But um, type that is a bit more detached from this, the kind of classics, they can be really more profitable in the end. They are kind of there to stay. Yeah? And um, it, it, it's better, it requires a longer period of insertion. 
And but following trends can be also challenging if you talk about um, big families. Yeah, I mean, one thing is to have just one style and one small character set, but when you dig into other scripts and bigger um, families, then it become it's a longer process, of course. No? But you know, don't force your library into a trend like. Um, that is kind of cheating, and here two of our attempts that we dismissed. Yeah, in the end. Yep, no, don't take pictures. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have a. Um, <laughs> the missing one minute. <laughs> no, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we need 10 more minutes for this. Okay, so just to round, round, round up this part. Um, Creating a library concept, a licensing scheme, a pricing model, you know, communication strategy, all this relationship is very much key to building a brand, but that's not all. Setting high standards, um, aiding educational efforts, and collaborating with colleagues, and of course, having good karma, all of this is um, key to building a company. Um, of course, we are in this branch and con uh, concept here, so context, um, we want to talk, touch on that a little bit. Uh, possibilities, real possibilities in other markets. Um, here, it's a little bit a question of viability, economic viability, particularly for a small foundry. Uh, so this is something to consider. Yeah, I mean, um to make it short, I mean, if, if you think about this, um, when we started back in 2006, we started working with um, Central and Northern Europe um, characters and accents, uh, Eastern, and, and and these helped us a lot because there was there were not many fonts uh, that carried these accents, uh, not for text anyway. Uh, when you look at a map and you say how how much. Uh, of the map is using actually the, the Latin alphabet. You say, okay, well, there is uh, um, a lot of of these that is not really well covered. And actually, when you see where the font sites are, you say, okay, well, uh, there's not much happening here. There's not much happening here. So there are areas to work. Um, and kind of these economic centers are changing. We see that, <clears throat> and that's moving a matter of time. But also offer. Yeah. So why would you expand into foreign script at all? <clears throat> well, it's kind of new challenges, um, personal and um, yeah, on a commercial level perhaps as well. And um, you both can actually make an impact there. Can actually make a difference there, a positive difference there. There's still a big lack of. of at least in a kind of text proper type field um, and a variety of ways and styles and so on. There's a lack, there's a lot of underserving going and ill serving. Um, so there are kind of, let's say, three categories perhaps um, a thing of self initiative, self initiated, semi initiated, and, and fully uh, paid. Projects and so we kind of started close at home. And this is uh, Adele um, with help of, of typographic um, consult consultants, of course. Yeah, I mean when you sort of venture into a different script, uh, you need help. And there's um, I think a new generation of, of good designers. Yeah, in, in these regions and an increase um, of the awareness of design in general and that all of that sort of demands uh, more variety, more quality in, in the offer. And also it seems that the wild days of copyright infringement are sort of retreating. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this is, these were just some uh, projects we had. And, but then you can also go really even further, self-initiated. Um, so this actually started three years ago here in TDI. And we now kind of... It's still not done. <laughs> <laughs> 
But um, the, the question of tying this into the library focus, uh, well, it is, for one, a typeface that sort of proven, in, in the Latin, proven itself um, in this more multi-purpose kind of field. Um, so, therefore, we started with that as a, as a starting point. And here is shown with TDI. So yeah, potential problems. Well, um, <coughs> basically, uh, it is more expensive. It is more expensive because you have to learn stuff that you don't know how to do. You have to hire people. Um, there, there is uh, post production costs, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but still, um, probably the, 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 the key issue here is that uh, how do we sell it? We, we might need even help understanding how to sell this problem. But uh, still, I mean, this is just to show you this, um, how it can work sometimes, a kind of a partially funded, so by um, a, a client started initially the project and we decide to continue. And then there are these other projects um, that are really custom custom made, um, like this one here. So far, we only had Cyrillic and Greek happening, um, but we hope it's going to expand. Um. Well, but um, just to finalize, I'm just I mean, it's all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there is a thing of where, where the boundaries of the type library. Um, explore those boundaries and try to work on the edges. And also, understanding that sometimes we do not really know where those boundaries really are. And this is uh, a, a nice example. This is our, our um, typeface uh, Brie, which would be designed more like a corporate font. And, and when a good designer drafts it, they can use it in a way they didn't expect it to be used, like in a newspaper. OK? OK, it's an art in newspaper and everything. But they can find another way to do it. And, and this other font that I will show you was designed for books, but for real printed books, actually the luxury books. Uh, and this was an attempt to, to escape from the, the squareness of the pixels. But then it ended up in, in, the, in the iPad and the iBooks application, OK? Because someone said, OK, well, this can work on screen as well. Um, so we don't always know um, how, what is the destination of our forms, really. And the other thing is, uh, I want to show you, uh, this is uh, Iskra by uh, Tom Grace, he's here. And this is a very clever and new design, something really novel. And you may expect it to be you know, a display or whatever, but when you put it in text, in real text, this works perfectly nice. And we end with Herz Alvagata. Which is another example of You've seen exploring the edge of the boundaries, really, and uh, trying to move the boundaries of the, 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 the focus group. <laughs> and, and, and yes, you go. And you have a poster in your back. So yeah, thank you.